you are in the session, How Vulnerable Are We to Scams by uh, Dr. Marcus Jacobson and uh, Ting Fang Yang. So please, um, I request a warm applause for them. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So um, I'm going to talk about scams and metrics associated with scams today. Uh, first, to give you some background, um, here is a collection of things that end up hurting the consumer. Um, there are breaches and hacking, of course, that lead to PII and credentials being stolen. And that leads to identity theft, account takeovers, and credential fraud. Malware and phishing does pretty much the same thing. Um, and then there are scams. Uh, traditional scams uh, and scams in people's minds are the Nigerian scams. But there's a big change underway in terms of what we're seeing with respect to scams. Most scams um, result in victim initiated payments. So this talk focuses on scams and other things that relate to social engineering. So um, if you look at phishing, for example, traditional phishing has a yield, which is the success rate has a yield of between 3 and 5%. Um, now, of course, it's very different for different types. Um, targeted phishing, which is what's called spear phishing, has much higher rates. It has rates of about 10 times more. You could also get much higher yields with what we might call sneaky phishing attacks. So let, let me explain sneaky by uh, saying, starting by saying what is not so sneaky. So if you get an email that says that you've got 48 hours to log in and update some information, not sneaky. Everybody alive knows that as a phishing attack. However, if you're getting an email, say that you're an eBay user, and you're getting an email from another eBay user asking you about a purchase you made, and you have to click on a button and enter your credentials, of course, so eBay knows that it's uh, you, and then you know, give the response. Well, recast as a phishing attack, that is a sneaky phishing attack because even though structurally it's identical, somebody receives an email, follows a link, enters their password, boom. It's a phishing attack, right? But in the minds and hearts of the users, this is totally different. So technically phishing attack, emotionally not so much. And that's what I mean by sneaky. Sneaky attacks also have an order of magnitude higher yields than traditional attacks. So um, traditional scams are not sneaky at all. In fact, you might have read a paper by Cormac Hurley at Microsoft from a few years back where he talks about why Nigerians say that they're from Nigeria, right? In fact, that is to scare off everybody who will probably figure out that they're being scammed anyway and will just be pointless work for the scammer to talk to and only keep those who are truly gullible. So that's a thing of the past. That's when the scammers advertise the fact that they're scammers only to get the true victims to come and seek them out. It's not happening so much more. And the reason is scams are getting targeted. What is happening is that scammers purchase or just have data, PII and um, credentials probably from breaches since that's, uh, there's a lot of such data, and they feed it into the system. And they create much more credible scams. Again, rising it by about an order of magnitude in terms of the yield of the attack. So that's one part of this talk. Another part of this talk is to look at the sad consequences of such an improvement of yield on the psychological side, namely, there's a corresponding improvement in the yield of having things go through the spam filters. Spam filters depend so much on what the end user does that it reflects the end user's opinion of a message. So to size up the problem, um, there are three parts really. One, there's a consumer facing part where the consumer ends up paying. That has been measured to about four billion a year in the US alone. And, and that is probably an underestimate because uh, it's not like insurance where people uh, report it when it didn't happen. It's the opposite. People don't report it when it did happen because they figured what difference does it make. But so this is a pretty decent estimate still. 
And then there's the portion of the consumer problem where somebody else picks it up. Like a bank ends up paying the, the costs of the deceit when the consumer falls victim to it. Um, there are no crisp numbers on that, but people believe that that's something of a similar or larger size. And then there's the enterprise problem where the victim is a, it's an employee of a company. And the entity that suffers, of course, is the company. And nobody knows the size of that because it's simply not reported. It's, it's embarrassing, it's bad for the stockholders to know it's silent. But so imagine those three parts. And then uh, keep in mind that the consumer part, which is the one that is the most measured, one out of 30 adult Americans every year falls victim to this. And the reported losses every year is about $2,300 per person. So, so it's, not small, it's small, not small money. Now, it depends very much on what kind of scam we're talking about, how much money there is. The 2,300 is the average. There are many scams that only harvest a few hundred dollars. Um, then there are scams that truly pump the money out of victims. One notable one is the romance scam, where the average is $16,000. That's typically the life saving of the, of the victim, many of which are middle-aged women. Um, you might think that this would be a scam that men would fall for more, but that's a mistake. Men think it's okay to go and meet somebody in a bar. Women, not so much. They feel much more comfortable online, and therefore they fall for this. So this paper is looking at what is the yield, or rather, what is the block rates from the scam messages being sent out by the attackers, being filtered by the message service providers, Gmail, Yahoo, Microsoft, and then being filtered again by the end users. The end users reading the message saying, no, nah, this is fake, or they're looking and saying, hey, good deal. So the first part of the presentation is the block rates for the email service providers. And here, many of you might be surprised that Gmail is actually not leading. You got block rates of about two out of three for Microsoft and Yahoo. And then you got really weird block rates for Gmail, and I'll get back to exactly what this means, between 10 and 98%. And it really depends on does the attacker know what to do or not. And this is not something I knew when I started this study. It's something like we could just fell into and realized at the end of this that, wow, this is how it must work. So you got yields that are pretty decent. And this is not for mes messages that we custom made uh, in order to go through. We took scam messages that have been around for several years to give them a fair chance. We did not add any spam poison. We didn't do anything super sneaky. We just tried to get it through. The second part speaks about the human component here. What are the block rates there? Well, you got the very Nigerian scams, you know, I'm a Nigerian princess, you know, got lots of money, I want to give it to you. A very small portion of people think that is a good idea. About 4% of the population thinks that that's worth considering. You got an order of magnitude higher rates for what I call the sneaky scam. And I'll get into an example what the sneaky scam is. Uh, now, let me talk about how this experiment was carried out. The first part about the email, we created a number of email accounts. Those that I show on the left side, which are sender accounts, and those that I show on the right side, which are recipient accounts. There, these are just 12 accounts that were created fresh by us. There were Microsoft accounts, like at Hotmail, there were Yahoo accounts, and there were Gmail accounts. And then I got a repository of about 300,000 scam messages. From those, I took and sampled a few hundred that are several years old. I didn't want the very new ones. I didn't want the ones with spam poison. I didn't want anything that was extremely unusual. But there are about four to 500 scam messages that were selected at random from this crowd after these criteria were applied. And then, in essence, I sent the scam messages from these accounts to the recipient accounts. 
Now, there's one thing I learned immediately. You can't do that on Yahoo and Gmail because they got an outbound filter. And if you are a scammer, well, they figured it out after five or 10 or not more than 15 emails that you send, at least if you send different emails, each one of which is rather scammy, they lock you down, they kick you out. So in order to simplify my work here, I went for Yahoo only. <laughs> now, I've talked to the people at Yahoo and they said, yeah, I mean, no. sorry about that. But I'm happy, right? So I created now only three Yahoo accounts. They're the sender accounts. They send to Yahoo accounts, they send to Gmail accounts, and they send to Hotmail accounts. And they send these scam messages that I've collected, and they send them at time intervals of between two and 10 minutes, randomly selected. Now, I added one more thing. And this might not be entirely fair. I auto-responded from all the recipients' accounts. I sent a simple message, thanks, immediately. Right? You might ask, why did I do that? This is not what a real scammer would get. Well, actually, real scammers would like that, and some of them seek it out, and there are ways to seek it out, but they typically don't get it. Not without creating some recipient accounts of their own that will respond, thanks. But they also don't send 427 different scam messages within a short period of time. They take one, and if they're locked down, and which of course they will know because there's no yield and also their own recipient accounts that they send to won't get it, so they know, they will just change the spam poison and they will get through again. So what I do and what scammers do is different here. But this is to, to get a most reasonable estimate of what the block rates are. Now here's an interesting part now. My configuration of two of the Gmail accounts failed and they did not send a response. So I have one Gmail account that sends responses and I have all the Hotmail accounts and all the Yahoo accounts that send this automatic thank you. And the reason that is interesting is that's how I learned what Gmail must be doing. The Yahoo and the Hotmail accounts, about two thirds of them were blocked. So in other words, the yield in, just in terms of delivery is 30%, give or take. For Gmail, it really matters whether the person responds or not. If the person responds, the block rate is 10%, super bad. Whereas if the person doesn't respond, it's a 98% block rate, fantastic. So you could see here, Yahoo and Microsoft, they look at the content to a very large extent. Gmail does not. Gmail looks at the reputation of the sender in terms of what recipients do to his or her messages. Now, of course, that is bad news when this becomes known. And scammers probably already know. Because what scammers will do is they will seed their accounts by sending out messages to their own accounts and respond. Or they will find accounts that automatically send responses, and there are lots of them and they will send messages to those and get responses automatically. And then they will be good for a while. And that's the problem with the Gmail approach. Then there's one portion of this about how it works that I did not investigate, and that's another common component of the spam filters. That's what's called velocity. If somebody sends a million emails, they're probably bad. If somebody sends, in a day, 50 messages, they're probably good. Now, this is something, of course, that scammers know of. And they send a rather low amount every day to avoid the velocity checks. And also, the more they target people, the less they have to broadcast it to the entire humanity. And the more they could only send to their actual victims. So let me talk now, and by the way, I'm very happy to take questions. If anybody has questions about this part before I go into the um, second part, the human part. But I'm also fine to take questions at the end. So, anybody who's got questions? Then I'll move on. Have you have a question. Please grab the microphone. There's a microphone somewhere in the middle. Okay, yeah, this one's working. So, with the Gmail account for that blocking, does it actually block in response to the sender 
or does it block in response to the actual email, the content of the email? Very little content consideration. Um, you could see that in the difference here. Those, the, those senders that did not respond, 90% of the scan was delivered. So they do have content checks. But those who did, res the one that did respond, you got a 2% delivery. So it makes a tremendous difference what you do as a recipient, or rather, it makes a tremendous difference to the sender what its typical recipient does do for Gmail. And it might be the same for Yahoo and uh, Hotmail. I wish I had the same configuration error there and would have learned similar things. But I can only speak about Gmail. Got it. Thank you. And no worries. Thank you. Work for a spam filtering company, Cloudmark. Uh, in terms of outbound spam, we've been watching Yahoo for a while, and um, I, they are better than they used to be in terms of blocking outbound spam. So what you're seeing now is, is the better version of Yahoo. Um, and I, I'd also like to ask, uh, for the Hotmail and Yahoo, those block rates, did you try those with not sending a response in the same way as the 98% Gmail, and did that, you know, is there evidence that that might change their block rates and improve them? So the question is, did I check not sending a response for the Microsoft and the Yahoo accounts? And no, I didn't. I wish I did. This was really a fluke. Um, this was a configuration mistake on my part and on my co-author's part. We meant for everybody to send the responses. And we were puzzled at first and then overjoyed when we realized what happened. But by then, it was really too late to start all over and do it for Hotmail and Yahoo. So it's a lovely experiment to try. And anybody interested in trying it, I'm happy to give you guidance what to do and um, to share some of the scam messages you might need to do this. But I don't know. So let me jump into the second part of the talk, which deals with the human component of this, which means how scammy is an email to a person who receives it, where the scam f spam filter hasn't filtered it out. Now, what you could do, of course, is you could show a bunch of people a, a message and ask them, how risky is this? This is essentially what phishing IQ tests do. And they do a marvelously, marvelously bad job because these are leading questions. They're leading questions and people are really looking for things. They're looking for spelling errors, which is a thing of the past. They're looking for bad URLs, which, you know, under normal conditions they would never discover. But maybe if they're at the height of their awareness, they will. In other words, phishing IQ tests that show people something and ask them, is this good or not, they simply don't work. Now, a good way of figuring out has been developed for phishing to determine the yields of phishing. Uh, this is called naturalistic phishing experiments. The way it works is that you are the fisher. Now, the only difference between you and a fisher, well, there are two differences. One is that you don't go to jail, and the reason you don't go to jail is you don't collect the credentials. But you do verify them. You find a tricky way of verifying the credentials that people submit when they think that they go to a real site, whereas they don't. And that way you really measure the success rates of various phishing attacks. And you can figure out beautiful yield curves using naturalistic phishing, phishing experiments. There are a couple of big problems with these. One is that inter internal review boards, IRBs, they hate them because um, these are very complicated studies and they potentially do put the end users at some risk or perception of risk. And that's a touchy issue. And they're very difficult to design. How do you verify somebody's credential without actually touching it? And moreover, without being able to touch it? You must be able to prove to them that I actually could not see your credential, but yes, I knew that you entered it correctly. And this might seem like some kind of mind puzzle. How can you do that? Let me not get into that. There's a bunch of studies. I can give you examples and references afterwards. But this is how you really want to do it if you want the baseline truth. And you're not a fisher and you're not a scammer. Now, short of that, what you have to do is something else than these phishing IQ tests that is better than that, but not as laborious as these other tests. And one contribution of this um, study is to nail down a method that seems to work a whole lot better. And this is how it works. 
you show people messages and you ask them, what type of risk is this primarily associated with? So you show them a bunch of things. And for each one, they have a Chinese menu of potential risks. And they have to choose what they think is the most plausible risk. I'll, get, I'll give you an example. So here's a message. You have exceeded your mailbox quota. Your account will be blocked AM tomorrow unless you request more space. You can request more space by clicking here. And of course, the user will click if tricked. We'll see something that looks very much like their normal login. We'll enter their credentials and we'll be fished. This is a phishing attack. But it's not the traditional you got 48 hours. So this is what I termed sneaky, right? So if we wanted to measure this, how would it work? Well, we would show this to people and then we would give them the Chinese menu. So the options here that were given is the recipient might get a computer virus. The recipient might lose his password. The recipient, th th this might be a scam aimed at stealing your, stealing your money. There is no risk. The recipient may get unwanted advertisement. And finally, the recipient's account may be blocked if she does not pay attention. Right? Those are the options I give the subject. And they have to pick which one is the most plausible. Now look at this. The correct answer, of course, is the recipient may lose his password. That, that's what people should answer if they really know it. But we don't want to say that anybody who does not answer this um, would have been victimized. Uh, that's a mistake. In fact, there are lots of reasonable answers. Here are two. The recipient may get a computer virus, and this may be a scam aimed at stealing your money. Why do I call those reasonable? Well, there are two arguments why it's reasonable. One is that they, they lead to the same result for the end user. The end user says, whoa, this is bad. I'm going to stay away from it. It doesn't matter why, they stay away from it. So they, for the wrong reason, have the right response. That's one of the reasons why I call this a reasonable answer. The other one is that we may know the technical classification of this attack. But what does it matter if you know, Joe on the street knows or not? He knows this is bad. If he calls, you know, if somebody steals his credit card and uses it and he calls it phishing, well, he's got the wrong word, but he's got the right idea. Somebody did something bad to him. So these are reasonable answers for those reasons. Now, there are also naive answers. There is no risk. That's surely a naive answer. The recipient may get unwanted advertisements. Yeah, I'd say that's naive in this context. And also the recipient's account may be blocked if she doesn't pay attention. Super naive. They've really fallen for it. That's the wrong answer, if anything. But let's call it naive. Now, do this to a large number of people and look at the rates. For this particular one, you got a naive rate about one in three. So remember, traditional phishing attacks have about a three to five percent yield. This has an apparent yield of 30 percent, about an order of magnitude higher. Makes sense. This is a sneaky attack. Now let's do the same to other attacks. This is a traditional Nigerian scam. I'm a Nigerian princess. I want to share my wealth with you. What portion of people think that seems plausible? They've been given a similar Chinese menu of options, of course, customized to this particular attack. It doesn't speak of you may lose access to your account, but it, it's really credible under some norms, the different options. 6%. That echoes very well what we know about traditional Nigerian attacks. Now comes interesting things. Targeted scams and sneaky scams. The naive rate jumps up to 63%. So for targeted attacks, what it could mean is that somebody breached a database and they know, for example, that you're an Amazon Prime shopper and sometime in the past you bought a pair of sneakers, right? It's not so far-fetched. In fact, Amazon doesn't sell all the goods that are sold on Amazon. There are lots of mom and pop stores. Many of them use uh, software like Shipworks. Shipworks 
has no capability of forgetting. Any customer ever is in there. So if a database like that gets breached, whether by malware or hacker, well, you've got lots of very juicy customer information. I use this example because my wife got one of these. Now, she didn't fall for it because she's ridiculously paranoid because of my activities and because I've challenged a bunch of students in the past that they should try to fish me and do their best, and my wife is also fair game. So she doesn't fall for this. But this is happening, and it's happening a lot. It's fed by breaches. You also got a lot of sneaky attacks. One common sneaky attack that also feeds on breaches in a sense, it's sending out an email to people saying, dear Anthem user, whether the recipient is an Anthem user or not, they have a pretty big market share, we have um, been breached, and your data is out there, but we will provide you free identity protection service for two years, sign up here. <laughs> what an elegant way if you're an identity thief. You get people coming to you and giving you them all your, their information, social security number, address, you know, bank information, you name it. And that's rather successful, not because it's targeted necessarily. The, the, these attackers don't need to know that you're an Anthem user, they just know that a good chunk of the population is, and, but it's sneaky. It's sneaky because <clears throat> this comes out of nowhere to the typical consumer. So part of this study, we asked people for a bunch of demographic information to see if you know, men were more vulnerable than women, old people more vulnerable than young. The only thing that was really interesting is we also asked people, do you know how to spot scams? And some people said yes and some people said no. And then we looked at the performance between these two groups. There was no difference. It's kind of amazing. Those who say that they know how to detect a scam did equally lousy as those who said they don't, actually. And if you consider it, it's not one scam that gets you, but it's a series of scams that you have to stay free from. We let people look at eight scams, actually seven scams. There was one red herring, so seven scams. Some of them were sneaky, some of them were not. Some of them were targeted looking, others weren't. Right? And then we look at what portion of the population of our subjects had correct or reasonable answers to all of these. No naive answers. The answer, 12%. So, you know, of course, double the number of exposures and you'll see this rate falling again. So you can get any number you want to here. It doesn't matter. But it speaks of the risk of the typical user out there. Now, in that context, it's particularly sad how bad the spam filters work. The spam filters do not really protect people. The reason is very simple. They're spam filters. They're, they're made to block spam. Scam is not the same as spam. Surely targeted scam isn't. So that is making it a difficult problem that the wrong tool is used to address to address a nasty problem. You can get more information in the paper, and if you have any questions, I'm very welcome to uh, answer them. Thank you.